My name is Andrea Zambrana. Today is March 2nd, 2016. I am at the George Sutherland Archives on the campus of Utah Valley University, interviewing Dr. Letitia Archuleta for the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk. Today we will be talking about Dr. Archuleta's life and her many contributions to the lives of others. Thank you for taking the time to do this interview today. I understand you were born in Salt Lake City. Who were your parents? What is your ancestry? I was born in Salt Lake, um, June 20th, 1959. Um, my parents immigrated here from other states, not from other countries per se. Um, my father is Robert Archuleta. He's known as Archie in the community. And my mother is Lois. Um, my father is of Hispanic Latino descent, um, raised in southwestern Colorado. All his family has been there for many generations, so that when that was part of Mexico. My mother is of German descent and um, was raised in Nebraska, came to school at Westminster College in the 50s when um, it was a Methodist school, and so she came here to um, attend college. Um, I attended school in Salt Lake City. I was um, at Parkview Elementary, my alma mater, Glendale Junior High. I went to South High School, which is now the downtown campus of Salt Lake Community College, and um, then the U of U for undergrad, med school, and my master's degree. So I really am a local person. <laughs> Tell me about your family life, your parents, siblings, your birth order. I, so, I sort of told you about my parents. They are still both alive, healthy, involved in the community, very active in their own lives. My father, they were both trained as teachers. My t father was a teacher for many years, then went to the Board of Education. So education, learning, big stuff in our family. Um, I'm the eldest of five. I have two younger brothers and two younger sisters who are all doing pretty well and all live in Salt Lake City except one who lives in California. Um, what are the important memories that you have from your childhood? You know, I had a, I had a very happy childhood. It was, um, you know, we were outsiders, sort of, in our neighborhood growing up, being a mixed-race family. My mother's Caucasian, my father Latino. Um, and, you know, we, it was a unique time back in the 60s growing up there. But it was still happy. We were a very close family. Um, we were involved in lots of activities in the neighborhood and with our friends. Um, my, one of my best memories are, given my parents both came to Utah to go to school or work, um, we traveled a lot to Idaho and Colorado, which is where my parents' families ended up. And so those car trips with the, you know, the seat down and the dog in the back and no seat belts and going everywhere all over the West was, is something I really remember very, very fondly. Um, other memories from my childhood, both my parents have always been really active in the community, both in politics and their church, and so people in our lives, people involved, people um, active in what was happening around them and in the world and in the news were around and part of our life all the time. There were always meetings at our house or going to meetings or meeting with other kids of families who were stuck at meetings too and kind of knowing that there was something bigger than ourselves going on. That, that was something that um, really sticks with me over time. Um, just didn't, we love music, we love the library. The library was a big deal, so I always love coming to libraries, like this beautiful new library you have here. It is the place where you grow, it's a place where you explore, it's a very safe place, and so I have, that's a very fond memory. Is there one experience from your early beginnings that you think prepared you for your work in the field of medicine? A couple of things. Um, one, my sister, just younger than me, two years younger, she had a lot of leg surgeries when she was very young, four or five and six. And she was in body casts from the waist down for almost two years. And we lived close enough to the school and we had one car, as many families did in the 60s, and I would push her to school in the wheelchair and try to help her get into class and field off the awful things that other kids say. And, you know, she was in a lot of pain and it was a really hard thing to be there for her. But it, it kind of, I interfaced with the medical world because of her when we were at primaries, which was in a different location than it is now in Salt Lake. And her doctors and 
you know, the people who helped take care of her and my parents. And so that was kind of an insider's view to medicine, which I wouldn't have had. I don't come from a medical family, so that wouldn't have been something I would have known. Um, but something that kind of changed me. I was about fourth grade, and now I look back and it's horrifying to me that at the time I didn't really understand what was going on. There was a boy who was walking in a funny way, kind of like a horse, kind of lifting his legs up and walking, and I had on my little white go-go boots and with my friends, and we were laughing and kind of mimicking him. And um, his mother ran over to me and shook me and said, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. He has a disease, and he will not live to be a grown-up, and don't make fun of him. And it was shocking and devastating at the time, and I didn't process it very well then, but as I kind of, it changed my, my feeling about my place amongst others and being, um, not, not making fun of people, being compassionate, being um, thoughtful, and, and trying to be kind. And I think that moment still is very emotional for me. It was a very moving thing, and, um, I really think that the way that I see other people in the world not only comes from my family and my background and just the way that we interacted outside of ourselves, but that event is just burned in my brain as something that said, you can be different than I was at that moment. Who are the women you admired growing up? Do you have one particular person? that influenced you or mentored you that you feel had particular influence? You know, I thought about this question a long time. I, there are so many women in my life that have touched me. Many teachers in particular. My elementary school, which I mentioned, Parkview, which is now called something different, was a, it was a new school. And when I went there, there, it was pod teaching and team teaching. So you were in these extended classrooms with three grades and three teachers. And teachers from all over the state would come to the school and tour and look at how they taught, look at this new way of teaching, which was very unique. And the unique thing about it was that you were allowed to just excel. You could be a second grader and doing fifth grade work. You could do whatever you excelled at, as long as you behaved and you know, kind of followed the instructions and got your work done. But you were given this kind of freedom to be there. And there were three teachers in particular, Mrs. McGlesten, who just recently passed away, another woman, um, Sheila Van Frank, who really touched me and um, made a difference to me, taught me to believe that you can, can you can be interested in many different things and push yourself and there are no ceilings. You can just do it till you're done, until you're tired. So those two women in particular, which were elementary school grade teachers, and then another um, teacher in high school, Jerry Southam, which taught me to love literature, to taught me, taught me to love reading and exploration of the world in a way that um, expanded what my parents and my my time in the library and all of those things did. She was very special to me. And I, I, I haven't seen her for a few years. I used to run into her periodically. But those teachers in particular made such an influence on my life. Um, my mom is a very brave woman, and I um, admire her. And she has influenced me, too. Leticia, why don't you expand on that a little bit? How did your mom? How did she influence you? I know we all have mothers who influence us, but is yeah. there a particular way that you admire her that you've, you've tried to pattern your life after? Yeah, she is a woman who is very gracious and very giving. She's involved, always volunteers. We were raised um, in the Methodist church, and we were, my father didn't participate. He was raised Catholic and decided he was going to stay home and cook breakfast on Sunday. And when my mother would, you know, haul us all to church and back and volunteer and be a part of everything. But that made us different. And it, we were different racially. We were different religiously. We were different politically. And um, my mother took a lot of flack for that. There were a lot of people who ostracized her and you know, made her feel less than belonging. 
and she was strong and she persevered and she never was afraid to give up or to just be part of that and that that bravery and even at times when she was just so sad or you know just I could tell it it just took everything in her to keep going she did and she just put her boots on and kept going and that is a great lesson that I use today I miss that she and she is kind she's just nice to people <laughs> and I like that and I, I hope to emulate her always so thank you for sharing you're that. welcome as a teenager and young adult, what are some of the activities that you enjoy? Well, I came from a family, and as we all know, teachers are not in the 1% of our nation of wage earners, unfortunately. And so, you know, financially, life was a bit of a struggle. So from the time I could, I, I worked. I babysat, I cleaned houses, I ironed the mailman's shirts, I, you know, rode my bike from Glendale to to Rose Park so I could clean this lady's house who was trusted her her house to me. So I worked a lot. I played with, you know, I did things with my friends. I loved to read. I think reading was my my kind of escape from the drudgery of that, having to work and, and work hard. Being the eldest of five with a 15-year gap between eldest and youngest, um, I really had a lot of household responsibilities. I had to clean and cook and take care of my little brother and um, and then try to work because my family couldn't provide me with the extra money that I wanted to be able to go to the mall and buy a nice the shirt that everybody had. That had to come from myself, so I was kind of driven in that way. But when I wasn't working, I enjoyed reading and music and, you know, like to go to movies, just, you know, did just different things. I, you know, but I think the thing that I probably was my go-to um, Thing that gave me the greatest pleasure was was to read. Did you always do well in school, or did you have subjects that were difficult? Well, I've always done well in school. Sometimes it came easier than others. Calculus and physics were two really hard subjects, as you're probably going through yourself. I got a tutor. I was able to succeed, and in fact, my physics tutor. Um, later went to med school and we have worked together in other settings and I thank him every day for being my, he's not a woman so I couldn't thank him in the first part, but he, um, he helped me get through physics. But those, I have a more literature and artistic brain in that kind of way than an analytical, you know, science, hard mathematical brain, so I have to work really hard at that. But you can do it, maybe work hard, it works and get help when you need it. And, it worked. What do you consider to be your strengths and talents and how have they helped you in your life? Well, I think compassion for others is probably my biggest strength coming from my family and that playground experience. Um, I really hope to be compassionate. I hope to be able to listen to people. I strive to do that. Um, I think being Again, you can see where this comes from, from what I've ex shared before, that just being sensitive to the feelings of others around you, paying attention, looking at people's faces, feeling the energy that you get from people. Um, if they're nervous, if they're angry, it helps tremendously when I walk into a patient room to get that vibe from someone, to be sensitive to it, to listen, to shut up, and just pay attention for a while so that I, I cannot be judgmental and be compassionate. So I think that's an acquired and a continually developed thing that I have to keep working on. But that I, I think of that as a personal strength. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of the main one. And I understand you graduated cum laude from the University of Utah, first with a biology undergraduate degree, then a master's of public health, and finally with a doctorate in medicine. How did you become so driven and dedicated to achieve in your education? And how did you graduate with honors? Well, you know, I'm very personally competitive with myself, and I set high standards for myself, and that comes from my parents, that if you're gonna do something, 
do it right and you know do the best that you can do and it may not be perfect and it may not lead to you know exponential success but if you do your best you can't have any regrets about it so for me I I love being in school I love being a student I love walking onto this campus and like oh I want to take a class here yeah I love being a student so being a student is I love that so that wasn't hard to keep going to school although not necessarily smart always but um, but just wanting to do it learning to learn loving to learn exploring finding out new things you learn about yourself and you learn about other things at that time so I think that's where my drive comes from yeah. 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 when you tell me about your family life today well I'm married. I've been married. I just had my 28th anniversary, so I've been married a long time. My husband um, is from Australia, so um, we've had to go through all of the immigrant issues and green cards and INS interviews and all of those things. I have two children. I have a 22-year-old son who's a student at the University of Utah and a 16-year-old daughter who is a junior at West High School in the IB program in Salt Lake. Um, they're awesome. I have a dog. He's beautiful. <laughs> but I, my family is my life. My parents are here. All but one sibling is here. It's all about family. Every holiday, every, everything is always about family. And the first person I want to talk to is my husband or my kids. And you know, I'm so thankful for the technology of today that we can text a hundred times a day and share each moment. It's just that's where my that's where my energy comes from, that's where my love of life, my passion comes from my family. So there, my, we're all here right now. I don't know if my, my daughter will stay here for school, but I really am thankful for the time that I have with my son that he decided to stay at Utah and um, just share time together whenever we can. Can we interject again? Sorry, I love hearing about your family. Do you mind sharing names of family? Sure. Names of dogs even? <laughs> I want to hear about your courtship yeah. with your husband. Oh my gosh, okay. Well, my husband's name is David, and my son's name is Jack. He's, he's really a John, but we call him Jack for his grandfather who passed away right before he was born. On my husband's, um, on my husband's side, my daughter's name is Emma, and my dog's name is Sperry like the shoes because his paws are brown and white so <laughs> they look like very top cider shoes um, I met my husband he came to the US many years in a row to ski to Salt Lake and he got to be friends um, with this wonderful group of people who in, when I was in med school I shared a house with some of those people and so over we met over a, a winter when he was here to ski and you know, we got to be good friends and he was working overseas at that time and so we you know wrote and talked once a week it wasn't like now where you could call every day and you know do that you had to plan your timing and it was expensive and um, we just really fell in love and got engaged and got married and he joined me I went back east for residency and he joined me there and then um, it was he's in the film industry and so it was difficult for him to work where I was and so I transferred back to Salt Lake and we came here and he's been working and now he he's, uh, kind of runs my office and does so, some film things on the side when they come available and it works with our schedule. And uh, he's still here. At one point we thought we might immigrate there, but the economy in the Australia was not very good at, right after we got married. And it was difficult for me to practice medicine there. The, Australian system is part of the Commonwealth system, Canada, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand. And their credentialing, although um, similar to the US, they didn't accept my US credentialing. So I had to re-credential and retest. And it was a year-long process. And then their economy went south and it was very difficult. And I, and I wouldn't have been able to practice the way that I did here. And we just decided, no, nah, maybe if we, when we retire, we'll go there when I don't have to work. So that would work. But anyway, so there's the two-minute nutshell of my courtship and family life. <laughs> Can I clarify? A so sure. You said you did your residency partly in the East, but you finished it here. Yeah, so I started um, in family medicine, which is the, I really, in medical school, did family practice, you know, honors and internships and things. 
and started that, I thought I wanted to be a rural family practice doctor. So be, you know, in the country with my bag and no horse, but kind of like, you know, what's her name, Quinn, the medicine woman. So I thought that's what I want to do. And when I, I went to Maine, which is the, the, really the center of rural medicine training, and I matched to where I wanted to go, and I got there and realized, wow, first off, I'm a West girl. You know, I'm from Utah. I like the, the scenario. I like the vistas. I like, I love trees, but there were so many trees. It was very claustrophobic, and I just did not thrive in that environment. And also, I realized that I really liked being affiliated with the university and that I needed other people to work with. I couldn't really be by myself. I, that just wasn't for me. So I came back to the University of Utah Family Practice Department, and then I um, continued to train, and then I worked uh, for Indian Health Service for a time, and that was a really terrific experience. Then realized that I might want to do other things. I was a little bit bored, and so I decided to work on a master's degree in public health as part of either doing public health or something else. So I worked while I went to school again, back in school, and um, realized I loved it. I loved public health. I loved what it had to offer. And occupational medicine is on the, uh, under the umbrella, it's a sister of public health, which is under the umbrella of family medicine. But I didn't know that early on. I didn't realize that they were all interconnected. And so really got turned on to occupational medicine, and that's what I ended up doing a s second residency in. And so that is now what I practice. And then that evolved. Aviation medicine is part of occupational medicine. And so that, this kind of this little step as it kind of spread out, but from rural back to Salt Lake, the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational and Environmental Health is a really terrific, well-respected occupational medicine training center, but also a center for um, industry in the Intermountain region. So I felt very lucky to come back and be able to be part of that after my second career choice, <laughs> after my evolution, if you will. What are some of the challenges and rewards about your career? The biggest challenge is to stay current. There are two really big challenges for me. Staying current is a full-time job, even if you didn't see patients all day or do that. You, you need to continually read. You need to do CME. You have to do it as part of your licensure. So you have so many CME credits you need to get, and all professions do this. So you have this kind of standard that you keep to, but not even just because you have to, but because when you go in to talk to someone, you want to know what's new, what works better, what is happening here, how can we do this in a better way? You need to know what's out there. So that, that takes quite a bit of time and more effort than I ever really understood as a medical student. The second thing is, is to not lose your compassion and to get burned out. And you know, medicine is in a state of transition right now. There's a lot of um, administrative controls, a lot of non-medical people who run, you know, health organizations that make rules that make it difficult for you to spend the time that you want with people or to do what you'd like to do. And so you can get cynical, you can get um, grumpy, you can feel like this isn't what I signed up for, I want to be with patients and yet you punish me for spending more time with patients and I get you know demerits or whatever for choosing to do it the way that I would prefer versus the way that this business model says I have to practice. So that cynicism can lead to kind of burnout where you just say, I'm done, I don't want to do it. The way that I practice now has evolved in a way that I don't feel that as much, but burnout and loss of compassion can just happen from fatigue and what happens in your life. You know, you're up with a sick kid for days and you're you have to go to work and you have to try to pull some compassion out of your heart to be kind to this person who their problem is unique to them and, and new and they want all of your attention and you're fragmented with you know either your personal life or personal illness or fatigue and it's just really hard not at times to keep that in perspective. It's not a huge problem for me 
personally the way my practice of medicine has evolved, but it is something that you know happens a lot. It's in the press a lot. You hear a lot of, uh, especially people who do primary care, um, because you are on a lot and there's a lot of pressure to perform in particular ways. So those are the two biggest challenges. The um, rewards are, there are, ma there are many, there are many. I love being, to connect with people and to be helpful in their lives, to understand something about them, to learn something from them. But there's something about medicine that, it's like when we came back into this room here in the Archive Center, there's the main library where all the regular people go, but we got to come behind the scenes and we got to be where it's special. And that's, to me, what medicine is. You get to be in the, the behind the scenes of people's life sometimes because people don't wear all their medical issues out on the front. You're very privileged and very honored for people to share with you their, their pain, their secrets, their joys you know, in different branches, and that is an amazing honor, and I, I love it every day. What experiences have permitted you to develop leadership abilities throughout your life? You know, I, I thought about this too. I don't know if I'm really in a, I ever would consider myself a leader, but I guess where, for me, I like to see the big picture, to see what's going on, to kind of be sensitive to what's happening, to figure out, to problem solve, and then not be afraid to jump in there and get dirty. You know, if you're, you can't, you can delegate, and that's important to delegate as a leader, but sometimes you have to just do it, and you need to go in and show people, yeah, I know how to bust the dishes and do this using a restaurant analogy. You can't stand up on your pedestal as an owner and never participate in the nuts and bolts of what happens in your world. And that being able and not afraid and not too stuck up to do that, you know, you, you just do it. You get in and you do that. And I think as by example, if you are there and active and participating and engaged, people see that and will follow your example and you lead in that regard, you know, you lead that way. I think that's, I think that's the, that's the thing I'm, I'm thinking back to when I was an intern and there was, I was on a pediatric rotation and there was this, this chief resident who was, was really tough and really had high expectations of himself and everybody else and he carried his clipboard around because then you didn't have electronic devices and he had this sticker on the back and it said no complaining no excuses just do it and that's kind of a motto I mean you really you just do it and if you do it people will see that you do it and it works and they'll do that and so maybe that's leadership I don't know <laughs> okay Apart from working and having a family, you're involved with various committees, such as the Occupational Residency Advisory Committee at the University of Utah, the Utah Medical Association, American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, and the Civil Aviation Medical Association. How do you manage so many commitments? Well, it sounds worse on paper than it is <laughs> in reality. Like, I'm the chairman of the Residency Advisory Board for the Rocky Mountain Center, and we have two meetings a year, and that's manageable with practice time. And I, I read and keep up on things, and we communicate by email. And again, the technology makes that connection much easier. Some of the other things are more you belong to, you get their newsletters, you go to some meetings, you, you, know, you, you put your input in for things that you think are important, either politically or um, career-wise. So they're not big time commitments. They're more thought commitments that you agree to yes, I'd like to participate in this organization. Let me see what you're doing. And you have a meeting once a year in Florida or Las Vegas, and you need CME time anyway. You might as well go somewhere nice and meet people and, and get ideas on how you might change your own practice or um, meet people that you might refer people to in another community. So it's, it's kind of like networking and more, you know, kind of day-to-day -day kind of things. It's not so much um, something that requires a lot of time. Uh, my commitment to my family and to myself is I don't tend to get involved in things that require a lot of time away from home 
or meetings at night when my kids are home. I want to be home. I want to be there with my family. And I don't want to be gone a lot unless it's really important. And I'll travel maybe once or twice a year to a brief meeting. But often, I have the whole family with me and we make it a time together. So I am very much like to be home and to be able to do things. And again, technology allows me to do many things from home that I couldn't do before that I would have had to leave. So it makes it doable. If you're comfortable sharing, what has been your most significant trial in your life? And how or and what have you done to overcome it? I had to think about this one too. You asked very thought provoking questions and um, you know, there are day-to-day -day trials. There are trials that you deal with your family and those kind of things. But I think in regards to this interview about medicine in the community and my being a practitioner of that, um, every physician's worst nightmare is that you might get sued. And that happens to, it's happened to every one of my colleagues. And it happened to me very early in my career. And it wasn't something overwhelmingly devastating of loss of life or something, but it was a missed diagnosis that, you know, had significance to that person and in the long run did not change their life in a negative way, which is my, what I hold on to that that, when it happened that that could be at peace, but it changed my attitude and it changed the way I practice medicine forever. You, before then I was much more idealistic. You. You do what it takes, you just get involved, you do everything, and you don't have this looming over your head in the background, but that changed after that. I always second, for a while, I second guessed myself about everything, and that was very destructive. But I was able to put that into a better perspective and own it and learn from it and say, okay, so now I don't ever want that to happen again. So how do I prevent that? I prepare a little bit better. I do a little bit more educational experiences. I reach out more and say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know, I, but I know where to look, or I know who to ask, or I know where to refer. And instead of having this idea that when you're fresh, I, I'm supposed to know everything, and I can't ask for help because it means I'm not worthy, and that's not true. And so. Although it was a terrible experience for myself and my husband, I didn't have children then, I am better for it. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm more careful. That's not always such a good thing, but, and we're forced to do things sometimes in medicine to protect yourselves from liability that you might not do. You might order an extra lab because that's what the protocols the lawyers put together say. You know, that that's an, a part of medicine that's not a very nice part of medicine. But the other part about being the best that you can be and making sure that you, you own your mistakes and know how your own limitations is a good thing that came from it. So that's that. Thanks for sharing. Are there any words of wisdom or maxims that you've lived your life by? Well, one of them I sort of mentioned before is eat, don't be afraid to get dirty. I mean, at work, at home, at play. just go for it. You know, if you're going to plant flowers, get out there and get in that dirt and have dirt on your face and do it your best. And in medicine, and especially in training as will come for you, is volunteer for everything. Just do it because when you get your hands in and you're there and you're experiencing it, that's how you learn. That's how I learn. I have to do things. I see it. I practice it, I hear it. You learn in whatever way is best for your personality. But for me, I like hands-on. I like to do it and just go for it. And the other thing is that I, I want to make a positive difference in my interactions with people. And so I, I want to make a difference. That's the thing. What accomplishments have given you the greatest satisfaction? And what would you still like to accomplish in the future? Oh, there's lots. There's so many fun, you know, your life is full of all of these tiny little links in a chain that add together. And there are, you know, big ones like I got married and it was a wonderful day and I had my children and everything went great. And it was, you know, oh, there were trials, but it was good. And um, the first time I delivered a baby was momentous. That was an amazing experience that 
is really high on the list. You know, those are great big things, but but just little things when you 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 make someone relax or you make someone laugh or my personal quest has been as a med student, as a resident, as a, a physician now or even in social settings, if there is always that one person that everybody's kind of tiptoes around and is kind of grumpy and that um, is just that person that people tend to avoid or be afraid of. And I just like to see if I can't crack those shells and try to interact with them in a way that will make them relax and not be fearful of them. It's kind of just this little thing that I like I, for myself that I like to do. And when that happens, that's really joyful for me to be able to maybe make a positive difference in that person's life, but also show them and myself that that person, you don't need to be afraid and that person is, is a good person too. Yeah. Uh, what, things for the future, you asked me too. Um, I look at my notes. Um, you know, I love medicine and I love doing it. And in part of my aviation practice, I joined a gentleman who was 93 when I joined him and worked every day and drove his car to work every day. And he passed away when he was 99 and a half. And he saw patients in his apartment because he couldn't get into work until three weeks before he died. He just loved what he did, and it was his passion, and I think it's what helped him to live so long. And I want to do that too. He did aviation medicine, but also some like family medicine that he, I joined him because he couldn't do the aviation part anymore, and I took his practice, but he continued to do the regular kind of medicine, and that's what he did until his death. But his model of working, there's no retirement from what you love. You just will do it. And, no, do I want to work 80 hours a week when I'm 75? No, but I want to keep doing it a little bit and I want to keep going. And so that, that working is another thing. But as much as I love medicine, which is what I was starting to say, there are other things that I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to write. Um, whether I, I keep journals and I keep notebooks for my kids and that, but um, maybe something once I did send a manuscript to a publisher and I was rejected and so I haven't been brave enough to do that again but um, it's something that I would like to do at some point in my life um, and then the other thing that I really loved and I told you I love to go to school so I take night classes at high school sometimes with my husband or with my kids and I took this class about voiceovers I always wanted I love books on tape and I thought I'd love to read a book on tape one day and be the voice on the tape so I took a class and you know, they really just wanted to sell you equipment on how to record, but um, one day maybe I can do that. <laughs> and can we have the name of the man you mentioned that you mentioned that was 99 yeah, and a half? Yeah, Swithin Chandler. So it's S-W-I-T-H-I-N, which is a very odd name, Chandler. And he actually, um, he was a great mentor to me, a second father, a grandfather. I learned so much from him. He was beloved by thousands and thousands of pilots in this area. And I just felt so lucky to have been able to learn from him and to be there with him and to be a part of his life as he um, approached his own death with, which, with an amazing bravery and courage. And that, that was another learning lesson too. So a good man. You mentioned you like to read, but are there other hobbies or talents that you enjoy doing in your free time? There are things I like to do. I don't know if they're talents per se. I play the piano, and um, when my daughter, who is now 16, when I was pregnant with her, I was very um, emotional. You can't tell that I would have been emotional about anything, but so I wanted to learn something. I always felt that the cello was this, just this forlorn, beautiful instrument. And so I took cello lessons while I was pregnant with my big belly and my cello in front trying to do that. So I'm not very good, but I periodically will play and just do that. So that is something that I enjoy doing. We enjoy hiking, skiing, cycling, you know, outdoor stuff. We like to be outdoors and take the dog for hikes and um, that's something. But one of the things that we really come to um, enjoy is travel. Australians, I mentioned my husband is Australian, they're walkabout. They travel, and that's how he came to be here is by traveling. But travel is a huge part of their lives. And 
My husband's family, family still lives in Australia, so we travel back and forth there to see his family regularly. But we also enjoy exploring the world, and we let our kids choose a destination. It, they each, each year, each, they alternate. They get to choose where they would like to go, something that they've read about, something that they want to see um, or do. And so that's been kind of a fun thing for us to do. Um, I used to have a lot more spare time for travel than I do at the moment, so there are shorter trips, but um, it's still something that is really special for us and that we, we do together even, even as they've gotten older, which I hope they'll want to continue doing. What would you like to be remembered for? Oh, for being kind to people, for having compassion, for caring, for, you know, I don't know, just making, making a difference for someone, for connecting with people. I hope that's what people will remember. I hope that's what people remember from their interactions with me as a physician that, you know, I really felt like she listened to me or she cared. And I hope my kids feel that that kindness and compassion is something that they've had an abundance of and will be able to pay that forward, you know. You mentioned in a magazine article that being Latino in Utah imparts a sense of social responsibility, a responsibility to live as an example, which in itself breaks down social barriers and creates opportunities for those who follow. Can you expand on that thought and give examples from your own life? And what advice do you have for Utah Latinas? That, you know, it's a really interesting thing. Um, growing up, not 100% Latino, is, was unique in that we didn't really belong in either community per se. My father is very, very active in the Latino community, and so we were always embraced, and my mother was embraced, and my, my siblings and I were embraced. But we, my mother's German, and she took French in college, and she didn't speak Spanish, and my dad speaks Spanish, and we went to, we learned in school, but we weren't bilingual, and that made a little bit of a difference, but people still, kind of embraced us. So with that as a kind of a prelude, I got to stand alone, sort of. And you could be, I could say, look, I don't have, I didn't have as many stereotypes as many Latinas and Latino people have now that weren't as big a deal then either. So that you could say, you could, you weren't pigeonholed as much at that time as you are now, I think. And so for me, I could just, be. I could be by an example. I say, I want to, I want to do this. I can do that. I can follow that. I don't have anybody's expectations to meet. I can do it because it's what I'm interested in. It's what I'm driven to do. It's what my talents lie in, and that can shine. I am Latina. I'm a woman. I'm a Utahn, and it can be expressed for all of those things. It wasn't just particular for that, if you, that's, it's kind of a, I know that's not very clear, but um, it was more a time of, you just, you do it, you were silent, you weren't as vocal about that part of your life at that point when I was a younger person. Um, at the same time, it wasn't, I felt included in the community, but a little bit isolated so that I had more room, I guess, is what I mean. I could just do it. One of the, the words I thought about, what advice would I have now, what advice do I have for my own kids, is that people pigeonhole you and say, you know, you can't do that, or you know, a woman can't do that, or a Latina can't do that. You have, you know, that what are the expectations? And I said, who makes these rules? You make the rules for yourself. And if you're an example to your community, all the better but you can break down the barriers by your action. If you want to go to college, make it happen for yourself. If you don't have the resources, help yourself find the resources. Reach out for you know, help financially or with tutors or whatever you need to be successful in your community. Um, don't believe, you know, you just, well, what did I, I wrote myself a kind of a little note that, you know, the only barriers that exist are those that you accept. 
So don't accept them. You create your own barriers and your own path and it can be filled with wonderful things. And yeah, there will be stumbling blocks. And yes, people will treat you differently because of the color of your skin or the, 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 your name. But you don't have to accept that. And you can, you can do what you want. You can be, find your own path. And I think for myself, the time that I grew up in and was approaching all of that was a little bit easier than I think it is, is for you or for my own children. But I still think that holds you create your path and um, you can shine for all the people that you want to include for yourself and that's the advice I would give is that don't let anybody tell you what you can do only you know what you can do and you choose it you know and that's very powerful is there anything additional you would like to have recorded about your life I don't know, I've been talked a lot. I don't know what else to really say. Um, you know, one of the, the other thing I guess I might want to say to people is that people put their hands out to me over the years. You know, my parents, teachers, scholarship committees, you know, departments at universities that embraced me and helped me find the path. And I reached up to that gladly and I was able to pull myself to the place I wanted to be with that help. And we have a responsibility, part of that question before, to reach to down to those coming behind us and to pull them up beside us and maybe even propel them ahead because we have a lot of challenges coming in our world and we need some bright minds and we need to give everybody the opportunity. And we, being here, that's our, our gift to others is to bring that up forward, so. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> I agree completely. Wonderful. Very well oh. said. You're very articulate and oh. what a beautiful interview. Oh. I just had to pull my phone out and take a picture of you because <laughs> I shouldn't cry, but I'm watching what you're talking about happen right before me. You're mm. an example to her and she's motivated and inspired by listening I to hope you. So. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to watch. Happened before your very eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, um, I'm I'm rooting for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope it really did mean a lot. You mm. really are what I hope to be with Zane. I know I love what you said because I do have a lot of barriers, but I know that I can still achieve it because there's nothing too hard. And I really love that you said growing up you had to work hard and. It's hard, but it's wonderful to be raised with a lot of challenges because it makes you stronger, and I can see that in you, and it makes oh, you more compassionate you. and empathetic. So thank you. Well, <laughs> go, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so Anne, does Anne do you have any questions you'd like to follow up with? We, in American Studies, we um, we like what we call quirky little details. So sometimes <laughs> just knowing what kind of dog you have is oh. important to somebody like me. What kind of dog do you have? He is just such a sweetheart. And um, he is a half border collie and half husky. So he looks like a border collie. He's kind of brown and black. He's got the white you know, stripe on his nose and floppy ears. But he has husky behaviors that are so endearing. He, I don't know if you know huskies. Have you ever had a husky? Mm -hmm. They talk. He does this. He talks and he meow meows and just is the craziest little thing. He's so sweet. He's very friendly and I love walking with him because everybody wants to pet him and he's really cute and fun. But um, we've got him, we never, I don't ever remember having a puppy and my son, we, we had a rescue dog that died about, oh, it's been seven years now and we just grieved for her so much and we weren't ready to replace her for a while. And then um, my son, he was, you know, like, we should, we should get a dog. I think, you know, we need to get a dog. And so he said, well, you look and see what you find. And on a, the KSL, there was a, a, a border collie breeding compound, I guess you would call it, or a farm, um, down in Draper. And um, a husky got in. So the dogs weren't purebred, and so they wanted to get rid of them. And so 10 weeks, we're like, oh, God, we'll go down. So we went down to the Home Depot way down south. And we, my husband and I said, you're not coming. You can't come. The kids can't come because they'll want the dog for sure. So we'll go. And he was solid, like, we're not getting a puppy. It's so much work. It's like having a baby. And 
So we, he goes into the, it was a pet smart. And we're in there thinking, I, the man who sold this puppy was very smart, knowing that if we went to PetSmart, we could buy everything we needed as we took the puppy home, and that's exactly what happened. He walked in the door, and this puppy with his little black face and his paws hanging over his arms, and we both just were a puddle. We just melted. We just fell in love immediately and played with him, and we bought a carrier and a dog bed and food and toys and took that puppy home. <laughs> so he's cute. Yeah, he's a dear one to us all. So. How many yeah. years have you had him? Two. You'd think he's brand new. I'm so excited about him still. <laughs> he's really sweet. He's a sweet boy. <laughs> um, Michelle had written down how did you balance motherhood and career. And I, I think it would be good to know maybe what was your favorite part about being a mom and what was the most difficult part about being a mom and your doctor at the same time. Um, see, I don't have prepared questions. <laughs> I have to think for a second. You know, being... Being a mom is wonderful and beautiful and hard and terrifying and joyful all at once. You're, you're never going to be more terrified than you are when your kid is sick for the first time or you know, you get a call from the school that you know, they fell on the playground or whatever. But that part, you know, that day-to-day -day part of being available, I think is the hardest because as a physician, I give a lot at work. I give a lot of energy to listen and be compassionate and be, you know, to do my job well and I have paperwork and stuff to do. And when I get home, sometimes I really would just like to watch Jeopardy and not interact, you know. I just want to be, but you can't, especially when they're young. And you parsing, pars parceling that out, I think is the most challenging thing of that time to give, to cuddle, to hold. And so, you know, you read, reading is a big thing, you know, in our family and my family too, and reading books at night and, and taking turns and every night you fall asleep in their bed and it's midnight and you get up and you got to do the laundry and you just do it. And that's the theme, you just do it. You find the energy, you find the power to kind of get through to the next morning. And, look for the weekends when you can all sleep in if they'll sleep, you know. So that's that part of it. I, I try not to take it to work, but I I um, family stuff to work very often. Occasionally if your children are sick, you know, you have to there's no one to substitute for me because I in my aviation practice I'm by myself. And so I have to go when I'm sick or whatever and Sometimes, occasionally, I've taken a sick child with me to keep in my office and that. But um, with texting and that, we have codes that, you know, if this is an emergency, this is how you, you need to, you know, I've got my phone in my pocket and I can look at it and not disengage from my patient. But I need to know that it's important if I'm going to interrupt an interaction with a patient to talk to you about something. So you can't call me just because, you know, so-and-so threw a grape at you or whatever, you know. I mean, it's, you got to that just comes with time, I think. And it doesn't get easier when they're bigger. In fact, it's a little bit more intense, I think, as that my kids have gotten older, because the things that they do talk to you about really do tend to be more momentous and more important and need your attention versus, you know, can't find my sock. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions, anyone? You mentioned teachers, three of them that influenced you. I was wondering if you wanted to give the spelling of your Oh, name. sure. So let me think. Um, Maureen, M-A-U-R-E-E-N, McGluston, M-U-G-G-L-E-S-T-O-N. So she was my fourth, fifth, sixth in that combined classroom. And Sheila, normal spelling, Van, V-A-N, capital F, Frank. So Van Frank. And um, she taught at Parkview for many years and then went over to Wasatch School. Um, and then Jerry, with the, I think it's J-E, is it J? I, it's probably G, probably for Geraldine. Gerald, Jerry, G-E-R-R-Y, -G um, Southam, S-O-U-T-H-A-M. That's helpful, and then you said CMA time. Oh, CMA, CMA is Continuing Medical Education. Okay. So yeah, that's what every, everybody has to do that, and it's a good thing. I, I mean, I think 
other times, other ways, you would be too busy with your life and you'd forget to check up on stuff. So, yeah. And the name of your younger sister who helped you motivate you to go to medical school. Yeah, we what call her name? Mickey, M-Y-K-K-I, but her real name is Michaela from the um, Opera Carmen because my parents had all music on, mariachi music, opera. My mother sings in the choir, so church music, I mean, it was all. But that's where that name came from. It's a lovely name. And, uh, she's a lovely young lady, and she's here in town. She does medical billing, so. Well, thank you so much for your Oh, interview. you're so welcome. What a, what a wonderful and inspiring <laughs> hour. We really appreciate you coming and taking time and just. Well, my pleasure. Think the world of you. I, well, at first I was a little like, ah, I don't think I fit your criteria. Which no, you then you talk to me and it's like, okay. Yeah, thank you very, very <laughs> You're much. welcome.